I served in the United States Army in the Infantry War with the 101st Airborne. While I was in active duty, I was deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. My unit spent most of our time in Mosul, Iraq, in the northern part of the country. Mosul is a very old city. There are sections where you would find holes in the street, and if you look down into them, you could see where the city had been built upon older cities. During the time of this occurrence, June 2003, we had just dealt with a riot by the local Iraqi people who were upset at the corrupt local police. So to help rectify the problem, we fired or arrested the majority of the police. This meant that to keep the police stations in the city secure, we had to then provide security and 24-hour guard on them. My squad had been tasked with a 12-hour nighttime rotation at a certain police station. The station was a three-story building in a very cramped and tightly condensed area of the city. The street in front of the station was only about a car and a half wide, and directly across the street was a mosque with at least 10-foot walls. There were roads on either side of the mosque intersecting into the road in front of the station. Myself and two other guys from my squad were sitting on the balcony of the second floor of the station, pulling security on our shaft. It was sometime in the night. If I had to guess, I would say it was sometime around 2.30 a.m. While on guard, we would use the lights on our rifles to illuminate any car that drove by so we could see if there were any sort of weapons in the vehicle and stuff like that. We heard a car driving towards us from one of the side roads on the mosque, so we got ready with our lights to illuminate the car when it came into view. Once we saw the car, we shine our lights into the vehicle, directing the light towards the driver. The driver had a typical reaction to the surefire light, which is blindingly intense, by squinting his eyes and attempting to look away from the light. The passenger had a much different reaction. His eyes seemed to glow with intensity by the light. He stared right back at the light, almost looking through it, and at us. It was very eerie. At the time, the best we could describe his eyes were that of a cat in the dark with a flashlight shined in its face. I have never heard of a person's eyes being able to reflect light like that before, or anything you could purchase to do such things, especially in a second or third world country. Well, after I got back to the United States, the movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, came out. So my then girlfriend, now wife and I, went to see the movie. I now describe the men's eyes as looking exactly like Emily's dead in the barn when she named all of the demons which possessed her. I am completely convinced that what I saw that night in Iraq was demonic or an individual who was possessed. I had a couple of incidents in Iraq. On my first tour, while at Camp Liberty, I was awakened by the sound of my father's voice screaming at me to get up. Get the fuck up. I was fully awake and shaking from the scream. When I found myself standing in the middle of my hooch, a few seconds later, I heard the sound of the mortar round exiting the tube and drop to the floor. The mortar barrage came in, but neither me nor my soldiers were hurt. My father had been dead for nine years at that point, but he had visited me in my dreams many times. He did have a foul mouth, but usually saved the F word for special occasions. I think this one qualified. On my second tour in Iraq, again on Camp Liberty, there were many times where I picked up feelings as I went to different places around the camp. Liberty is on the grounds of Saddam's hunting grounds and the place of many atrocities. His sons had their own cabins with which they did as they pleased. I'm also sure that many of my brothers and sisters in arms frequent the camp they came from. It happened on one of the few nights I was actually going to get some real sleep. In the middle of the night, I woke to the sound of my door opening. I reached for my pistol, and as I turned and saw a soldier in full battle rattle, full vest, helmet, and rifle for the civilian readers, enter my trailer. Oblivious to me, he put his rifle down and sat on the bed. I felt the bed settle under his weight. I pulled my pistol free of my holster and jumped up. He disappeared in front of me as I brought the weapon around on him. I was so shaken. I did not sleep the rest of the night and shortly returned to work. I was surprised I had not wet my pants. 
There were a few of her nights I had feelings, which prevented me from sleeping, but none as vivid as that night. I pray for the souls of those that wander in that faraway place. May God bring them to peace through those that love them and miss them. The City of the Living Dead Hello X, I have lurked here for some time. It's no secret that this place has gone downhill recently. All of it has just become generic repeating the same stupid generals and the same stupid 5-10 to 10 threads recycled every other day with the occasional genuine post that comes in once a month, not stalking, I am enlightened, YouTube slop, succubus, etc. So I am here, making this post, intending to do my part, and hopefully that could spark some change. With that boring intro out of the way, you all have heard about City of the Living Dead, black magic, jinn, talismans, and all kind of spiritual and magical stuff. In Iraq, where I am from, we have the world's largest cemetery, Wadi Al Salam or the Valley of Peace, located in Najaf. It's a massive cemetery that covers more than six square kilometers. It is filled with dead people, wars, religious killings, infants, soldiers. Even the surrounding streets are said to have people buried beneath them. From the 90s Saddam Wars, American invasion, the militias all fought and died around that place. The dead people are all around, literally. It's been there for maybe a thousand years, if not more. Probably more. The first who was buried there is said to be Imam Ali, the Prophet's cousin. It's said it was given to him in ancient times by the Prophet Abraham as a piece of heaven, which is why the Shia majority in the south, even non-Shia, but mostly Shia, bury their dead in that cemetery because they believe they all have taken a vow to protect all those buried near him from the tortures of the afterlife. Also widely believed that Ali will take those buried near him to heaven in the end times by repenting their sins. However, the stories about jinn and black magic that get buried there is numerous. All kinds of outrageous and paranormal things happen there. The graveyard keepers, which take care of the newly deceased, tell all kinds of tales. Jinn that appear at night, moving candles dimly lit. Witches and vile individuals who practice magic come in the night and bury dolls with talismans inscribed on them. They bury it, usually between two graves at night, for the talisman to take effect. A couple of interesting tales I got. The graveyard keepers wash the dead with water and soap. The soap is heavily sought after. The voodoo magician buy these soaps from the keepers for outrageous amounts of money, more than a thousand bucks for just a piece of soap. Additionally, most of the time, the keepers will never sell these soaps, regardless of how much you offer for them. They will also threaten you if you ask them to sell it, because they know for a fact it will be used for ill intentions. What is special about the soap? It's said that this soap will be pure filth or pure sin, because it carries all the sins of the deceased individual that got cleansed with it, which makes it the best ingredient for the purest form of evil magic. Another tale about an old lady. It's somewhat of a folklorish tale about a woman that died and her son was trying to bury her. She is known to be a witch. She practiced magic. And when her son tried to bury her two to three times, the car slash convoy that was going to transport her to the Valley of Peace crashed and some people involved died. The son in the end decided to carry his mother on his back to take her by himself that night without anyone else involved. He managed to get her to a grave that he dug at night and buried her there. While he was going back, he got hit by a car and died shortly after. The graveyard keepers came into this freshly dug grave the next day and did not know who it was for. It was an unnamed grave in a random place. Some time passed and other people were meant to be buried near that unnamed grave. They buried people near that grave and something unnerving kept happening. The people buried near the unnamed grave were dug up and completely butchered and massacred and the pieces were thrown under in the grave. The freshly buried people are not safe in their sarcophagus also. The magicians dig those graves out and pull out their brain, heart, different organs, etc. to use them for black magic. There is a lot of stuff involved here that dip deep into the paranormal. I'll put some pictures here and videos here and see how this work goes. 
Your story was good at the start about genuine topics. The story about massive symmetry. Then you talk about dolls, etc. It's total nonsense. This made it sound not any different from some guy who heard the word magic and now is all over speaking how it's creepy and how to do the magic. From what I read, there is some understanding of how things work, like making the ritual with soap or any object. If you had genuine stories from Cemetery and posted them here, that would be much more interesting. Or speak about stories we haven't heard in the West, and you can provide some sense to them. I mean, the stories I've heard are all voodooish in nature, but the sheer size of the thing is unfathomably huge. You could easily get lost there. It is a whole city of dead people and the amount of demand for new graveland is immense. The people are usually now buried in corridors, large underground spaces that fill 20 to 50 bodies, and these empty spaces with no life usually attract the spirits slash jinn from other worlds. I personally never interacted with a spiritual or a voodoo practitioner, but they do bury their spells between graves as they have caught some of them in the act. Why do they bury it near graves specifically is out of my knowledge. They also rub dead people of their organ meat, as it can be used for specific dark rituals. Those practitioners allegedly have some power over a group of jinns, and they aid them in these rituals. The practitioner demands are either money, or more often than not, sexual demands from the woman involved. Some people talk about losing sanity, or never being able to marry, or getting deathly sick due to these spells. I'm not from Najaf, so everything I heard about the place and the people involved, is just folklore from one guy to another. Well, yeah, but the shrine is also vaguely speaking in the vicinity of the cemetery, so it's considered as a singular place. What are some buildings that look like houses? How long ago did this start? Do they know where is a Mamali grave? From my reading, they have funeral rite, same like in the West, but more spiritually inclined, from what the wiki says. Each tribe slash family like to add their own architecture to the grave to make it more unique to them, so they don't get lost in uniformity, since the graves can easily get mixed up if they all look the same. The graveyard has been here for a while, probably more than a thousand years. Imam Ali is supposedly buried in his infamous shrine in Najaf, where he was buried after being stabbed by an assassin while he was in his mosque, praying. Yes, the rituals are pretty similar, though the Sunnis don't really like this a lot. They criticize it, as a form of idolatry, so they prohibit having graves that even have any kind of grave markings or building blocks that rise above the ground level. That's why you frequently see ISIS members destroying graves and holy places or cultural sites. They disdain these aspects as a form of shirk. During my first deployment in 2004, I was stationed at Camp Anaconda, pretty much in the heart of Iraq. After my unit had settled in, we were given the unfortunate news that we would be relocated to northern Iraq to FOB, Forward Operating Base, Endurance. This was terrible news, considering we had gotten used to the swimming pool and cable television Anaconda had provided. Endurance was no more than a few tents and old airplane hangars. For those unfamiliar with the invasion of Iraq by the US military, we basically took over most of Iraq's military stations and used them for ourselves. My unit was given two airplane hangars to house our four platoons. Outside of my platoon hangar, there was an old concrete bunker. One way in, one way out. With my unit's generator sitting within ten feet of the opening, which was a metal blast door. Well, months into my deployment, I became friendly with a female soldier from my company's mechanic platoon. We needed a private place to go, as the relationship we shared was, although known about, was instructed by our superiors to be kept out of sight, out of mind. Well, we chose the bunker. As we first explored it, the hallway from the blast door slanted downwards for about 20 feet until it came into an open area about 10 feet by 10 feet. Total darkness as it was underground. We would take our flashlights and our laptop computers each night down to the bunker and spend the night as I had fashioned a makeshift bed from my unit supply of lumber. We were an engineering unit. What made the bunker appealing was the early warning system that came with it. The generator, which supplied power to the hangar, was right outside the blast door. If any curious officer decided to go looking for us in the bunker, when the blast door was opened, 
the sound from the generator would instantly become almost deafening, and we knew someone had opened it. Enough background. Here is what stopped the bunker trips. Well, about the second night on, Sarah would wake me in the middle of the night, telling me she was hearing something inside the bunker with us. At first, I attributed the noise that she was hearing to hedgehogs, as that part of a rock is lousy with them. I shrugged it off until I heard the noise. There was no doubt. They were footsteps. The night before the last night that we stayed down there, I awoke to whispering coming from the corner, which was followed by footsteps that approached my side of the bed. I awoke Sarah and reluctantly turned my flashlight on, fearing what came next. But there was nothing. No body, no footprints, and worst of all, the blast door was closed, just like we left it. The last night started with Sarah warning whatever was down there that we were not in the mood to be messed with and that we just needed to sleep. We both fell asleep as we reassured the other that we were just hearing things. Again that night, Sarah woke me, and we sat there in total darkness, listening to whispers coming from the corner. Two different voices, followed by footsteps approaching our bed, and then our bed violently shook for just a couple of seconds, and then a tremendous sound, as if a metal plate had just been dropped next to the bed. In our panic, it took me a good 45 seconds to locate the flashlight. But once again, there was nothing there with us. No footprints. No evidence of what made the loud, crashing sound. That was our last night in the bunker. I was posted in FOB Anaconda during my deployment in Iraq. I was one of 24 soldiers who manned one of the four entrances into our base. We covered the north entrance where locals would enter and go through our security scanner, be checked for illegal substances, and be routinely verified by our K-9 division. We came across 80 locals who worked in our base on a daily basis, half who presented goods in our flea markets for sale at the bazaar, and the other half who worked for our construction yard, doing manual labor and earning American dollars since Iraq's economy was run by our dollar currency. I had grown fond of many of the Iraq locals during my deployment and began to grow interested in their culture and respected them as equals. During the end of my tour, I noticed that many of the workers had perished because Al-Qaeda spies would denounce their family and murder them when they had exited our base for aiding us and taking American money as a form of payment. We had a strict procedure of allowing locals inside the base. Each person was assigned a military ID card which had their picture, date of birth, and microchip attached to the card. After they are scanned into our system, they go through the x-ray machines to see if they are smuggling any items inside the base. During my last two weeks, something insane happened that was recorded on our reports that raised eyebrows across our company and was the ghost story of the year. One of my older locals, Hazem, that I generally talk to on a daily basis, came in through the x-ray but was acting very odd and pale. For the first time in months, he did not speak to or acknowledge me. He looked sad and uncomfortable, so I left him alone. I assumed it was a death in the family or something terrible had happened. I left him alone as he turned in his badge to enter the base. We did a recount on the badge IDs to make sure that all of the locals were accounted for and that the badges matched the correct number of people. By the end of the day's work period, the same crowd shuffled through the x-ray machines, picked up their IDs, and made their way back home to their own villages. I noticed that Hazim's badge was still hanging on our wall and still active in our base, according to our system. I quickly called the construction yard and alerted them that we may have a local that may have been left behind in the latrines or possibly wandered off the working area. They double-checked their cameras and said all individuals signed in have been signed out, and that their records were on spot. Our platoon sergeant was worried that we might have allowed him inside the confines of the base without checking him through the system. We did a thorough manhunt for him, but nothing came up. The base was put on alert, and the interpreters were notified of the situation, asking individuals to help locate Hazim. That morning, we checked in all the normal locals who were working, and noticed that Hazim did not return. 
so we marked him MIA in our records. Later that afternoon, his wife and son came to our control point with a cart. She was explaining to the interpreter what happened. The interpreter was pale and sweating as if he had seen a ghost. He reluctantly turned to me and attempted to collect himself. Azim was killed yesterday morning by an insurgent for working for the US. He was shot to death around 7am. During that time frame, his family was held hostage as they were being questioned by the terrorists as to who else had been working with him. Hazim was wrapped up inside the cart, his body cleaned and ready to be buried. We had mortuary affairs come to identify the body. Still crying and mourning, the wife handed me his badge that was stained with his blood. I exclaimed, that is impossible, as I knew we already had that badge inside the office. I ran in confusion to prove to myself that a duplicate must have been made, and to my astonishment, there was no badge on the wall. I checked the computers. There was no log of him entering the base on file, and I was extremely pissed and thought that someone was playing a sick joke on me. I told the interpreter that we all saw him enter the base, and that he gave us the ID. He replied that it wasn't possible, since he had been dead since the morning of that day. Puzzled and confused, I demanded to check the video recordings of the previous day to counter-argue that we were right. The video recording captured his M entering the building and scanning for the x-ray captured on video and as he got off the x-ray machine he vanished as he started to remove his badge we watched it over and over again in disbelief because that is physical evidence that he was there and everyone saw him his wife watching the video continued to cry as she acknowledged his appearance in the video our company commander had us destroy the video as it was in bad taste and morbid to release something like that on YouTube without facing UCMJ charges for uploading confidential footage. He was buried the same day with all of his relatives at his village. His co-worker came up to me and explained that Azim had been secretly putting money aside hidden somewhere in the base and had kept it away from the Taliban, preventing them from robbing him, and instructed his friend to give the funds to his family upon the possibility of his death. His co-worker explained to me, even in death, his loyalty to his family is bound by a soul and his love to ensure that they are taken care of. In a span of a year, Hazim had saved 8,000 US dollars, which was more than enough for his family to live off of for the next 10 years. Soldier Encounters a Demon I am a member of the United States Army, and I have a personal experience to share that comes from my deployment in Afghanistan. Due to the nature of my service, I cannot and will not share anything that will breach any level of OPSEC or InfoSec in any way, shape, form, or reveal any details that will or can be construed as such to compromise any operations myself and any of our members of the US military conduct on a daily basis. That being stated, here is my story. I am a US Army Infantry Squad Leader, a non-commissioned officer with 10 years in the service and I have 12 soldiers under my command in my squad, 10 soldiers, and two non-commissioned officer team leaders. My soldiers are ranked E3 to E4, with 18 months experience at the very least, with my team leaders having 4 and 5 years experience, respectively. All of us have at least one combat deployment together, with the senior of my soldiers having two. All of us have enough experience in our service that we are absolutely confident in our abilities and skills as infantry soldiers, and know what to do and how to do it, given any and all combat situations we encounter. So when we are given a mission as a squad, separate from our platoon, we did not really give any thought to the nature of the orders, or the fact that we would be a significant distance away from our platoon, or any ground assistance whatsoever, separate from any CAS or ORDI we could call on, and other assets available. I received the mission, issued the war now, made a plan, initiated movement, gathered recon, and completed the plan. I issued the op-ord, and we asked or mic'd. All the making and appearance of a usual and routine mission, something we did daily and completed daily, and then we reached the objective, and it all went to what I can only describe as hellish given form. 
We hid vehicles that were specifically designed for being explosive resistant and armored enough to give us an edge in surviving a multitude of situations that we would come across. It was dark, and we have NVGs on, approaching a small village, seven buildings, under the cover of darkness, being as quiet as possible, ready for anything. We entered, and cleared house after house, and found bodies, a lot of bodies. So many, it was hard not to step on them as we walked through the houses. The sheer number of them was startling. And I have never, in ten years, seen anything as disturbing or as shocking as the condition that the bodies were in. Some looked as if they were ripped or torn in half. I mean that literally, by sheer brute strength. Some looked crushed, as if a ton or more of weight was slammed into them. I mean, they were pulped. I have run over human beings with my six-ton vehicle, and I know crushed when I see it. And others looked as though some large animal had taken big chunks off of them in single bites, like a shark attack. We finally reached the end of the village and encountered something I can only describe as demonic. Thinking about it as I type this is giving me chills. I still have nightmares about it. First vehicle opened fire on it with a 50 cal APT, and he was going cyclic. Next thing I know, I see a 6 ton armored vehicle that can take up to 80 pounds of explosive force and come back rolling. Literally fly. Not roll. Not flip. Fly. It landed in the middle of the freaking village in pieces. Six damn tons of armor flew 700 meters. My vehicle was next, and I have never cycled an automatic grenade launcher so fast in my whole career. I was linking belt after belt after belt, and I was unjamming it almost as fast as it jammed. I am screaming my head off on the radio at the same time, trying to get a hold of my other vehicle, calling Cass or Artie, and ordered my squad to shoot this thing with every weapon we have even though I know for a fact that we were all doing it anyway. And I am still screaming. I can hear screaming and gunfire. That sounds like it's millions of voices screaming with us, with explosions and tearing metal. Absolute chaos is in control here. And I'm screaming, crying, and praying. But then, the craziest thing I've ever seen happened. Everything went absolutely silent. No sound, no voices, no gunfire, no explosions, nothing. The world went mute, and after that, everything slowly came back. My alpha team leader, who climbed up to me, had to slap me hard to snap me out of whatever hellish zone I was in. My best guess is shock, but unlike anything ever I heard, experienced, or watched, it took me hours to get it together and start attempting to control the situation, get communications with LT, and come to grips. First priority was the first vehicle. We could not raise them on comms, so I sent two to go and see if they were alive and needed medical attention. Then I realized we didn't get a BDA on the thing we just unloaded on. I directed my driver to get closer to the area, and I noticed something right off the bat. There was damage everywhere, except for one spot, and in that spot was untouched and pristine, like it had never been subject to all the firepower we had directed at it. Not a single impact. There was no sign of that thing anywhere. Not even a footprint. I have been deployed seven times in ten years, and I have never seen anyone or anything walk away from that much firepower. Ever. I knew for a fact that no human on this earth got. My five soldiers in the first vehicle left, miraculously, due to the cab being reinforced, but suffered severe blunt force trauma from impact. Enough that all five in the vehicles were immediately given medical discharge and 100% disability a few months later. My other soldiers are all receiving the best psychological care possible. I am undergoing psychological evaluation as well due to the report I gave to my command. The treatment given to me and my squad is no surprise. However, the way my report of the incident was handled and what happened after is very confusing and frustrating. No more about this has been mentioned or acknowledged again. I do not care if someone believes me anymore, as every time I am asked about it and answer, I am met with the reactions of disbelief or pity.
and sympathy for my damaged mental state. 